let's see, starting recording. Okay, yes, we are here uh, with uh, Stan Cox. This is the first time we're going to do this on video as well. So let's see, let's see if YouTube, um, let's see if the algorithm loves you, Stan. Let's yeah. <laughs> see if we break the algorithm. Let's break the internet. Okay, so in real time, what are we on? 13, 14? Mm. It is we, somewhere in count? there. It started a year ago, April. So uh, whatever that is. I'm gonna, I've been we, I've been taking numbers. Let's see. Let's scroll. <laughs> Let me scroll down here. Uh, and we, in real time, twelve. We're not. We're on number thirteen. Yeah, we we're skipped 13. December. Yeah. So we have a couple of things we want to do. I want to start with your article, "Catching Heat from Big Brother: Education and Climate in." Magaland. So this is about basically this is more good news from from your blog, an inspiring <laughs> story of how uh, strategists uh, are taking control of their public uh, schools and um, libraries back from the uh, agenda uh, to scare children and what is the other thing? Indoctrinate and scare children about um, climate. So what's going on there? <laughs> well, and even uh, more so, it, yeah, there are um, these efforts by um, the, the usual kind of organizations that are trying to um, get a lot of things banned from uh, colleges or from schools and colleges. Uh, but now, now they have uh, set their sights on uh, climate education as well because it's indoctrination and it will scare children and so forth. But um, a lot more of the article is on these state uh, legislatures uh, throughout the middle of the country who are, uh, as you've seen, and in Florida and Texas are, are kind of the um, poster children for this, um, trying to dictate what can and cannot be taught in uh, not only K through 12 education, but colleges and universities and uh, what books can be in libraries and, and what can't. And I'm arguing that a lot of this also has a big effect on our future ability to deal with climate because there, all of this is kind of a, a imposing ideological discipline uh, kind of thought control type stuff a lot a lot of what they're doing and it's going to undermine uh, students learning of critical thinking skills etc yeah. well it's interesting because public education and um, I don't know the kind of hegemonic idea of scientific progress and scientific yeah. method they sort of have been going marching together <laughs> i don't know over the past 150 or so years right yeah. since after right. the u.s civil war and now i don't know when it happened exactly i think it had i think it had started over climate maybe there were other things too but climate was a big one where they kind of took an they made it an attack on science like there's no such yeah. thing as a scientific consensus. You know, there's always doubt and stuff. And yeah. I guess we've seen like how that was borrowed from also tobacco, right? Big tobacco did it, yeah. but climate really, they really scaled that up, that whole merchants yeah. of doubt uh, kind of approach. And then with COVID, it's just completely blown up. Like with yeah. COVID, it's just, you the, the idea of a scientific consensus is like a joke now. It's like, it's something yeah. funny. You, <laughs> you say that in America or even Canada, people just think that's funny. They think it's ridiculous. Yeah. So that, um, and, and you know, long time ago, it was, it's been a long time since the US, there was support for public education in the US. But I, yeah. I find this a funny, there's a funny thing where I, I was thinking like, They'll never quite get rid of public education in the U.S., right? Because they need actually, if they did, if they yeah. got rid of it, they wouldn't be able to pass laws saying you can't have this book or that book, right? So they kind of, they're right. going to always yeah, yeah. need public education yeah. just to kind of keep this kind of culture war going if for no other reason. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. that's great. Uh, any other, any other things you want to do before we get to our main, our main, uh, yeah. 
meet yeah. our yeah, main yeah. beef. Uh, yeah, let's uh, move on to the ministry for the future. All right, all right. So we're about three years behind you and me, eh? I, I realized that yeah. uh, Cory Doctoro, I was looking at Cory Doctoro, did a couple of threads on this book, and yeah. um, there, there was a lot, there's been a lot of discussion of this book, including yeah. at my, uh, my faculty, Environmental and Urban Change. I think they teach different parts of it and talk about it. And... Um, and it's The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson. And Kim Stanley Robinson, I think, is a great, you know, I have a lot of critical things to say about this book, but uh, <laughs> I think it's a great book. And I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great thing to do because yeah. um, what he's doing is he's, he's, she's writing a book about how we get from here to there, which is like the book you never, ever see. You always see books about there, right? Yeah. Since Thomas More and Utopia, there have been books yeah. about there and how nice it is there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's books about how crappy it is here. But that idea that like it starts where we are and it gets to where we turn the tide and we have uh, we have a better world or a better chance. There's uh, this is the only book I can think of that does that. Do you know any books that even try to do that? No, I can't think of any. Yeah, I can't think of any. Mm -hmm. So even if you don't like things about it, which I don't, and we'll talk about <laughs> what I don't, and, and I know you don't either, um, mm -hmm. we still, at least we have something to talk about, right? We can say like, there's yeah. no way it would go like this, or, you know, maybe it could go <laughs> like this, but at least we have some somewhere to position ourselves uh, right. because of this book. So, so uh, my kind of stereotype about you and the way you approach any kind of climate solution is you basically go and you look it over and you do an analysis and then you show that it actually sucks. And my stereotype of myself is that I look at things that are really good and positive and then I just conclude that they're not going to let you do them. So <laughs> these are these are the yep. two I think these are the two lenses that we're going to bring <laughs> to our analysis yeah. of this book. So I think we can start with the things that happen in the book in terms of climate. So there's a big, huge heat wave in Uttar Pradesh in India that kills millions of people. Mm -hmm. There's a flood in Los Angeles, which basically permanently floods the city. Uh, there's later on in the book, there's a heat wave in Iran and Pakistan. Uh, there's 100 million plus climate refugees. There's later on, there's another heat wave in the southern U.S. And, you know, and then at the end of the book, there's kind of a happy, positive tour of all of the ecosystems yeah. in the world. Mary goes on a trip yeah. with her boyfriend and looks at everything. So, <laughs> and, and if I could yeah. interrupt, I, chapter one, I, I was hooked reading that chapter. If anybody wants to see what yeah, you know, what the future is probably going to look like. That is the most hair-raising uh, yeah. fiction I've read in a long time. It yeah, is. like he tries to go in the water, but the water is also too hot to actually offer yeah. any relief. And, yeah. It's yeah. And, so and how those, far did you get, Stan? How far did you get in terms of I've, disasters? <laughs> I've read only about to um, come clean here. I've read only about a third of the book but not the first third I've, I've kind of because I needed for something I was doing and I'd put off reading it too long and I needed to have some idea about the trajectory of the book so I've been reading uh, selected uh, chapters yeah. well my Twitter thread is kind of a guide now you can see which yes. chapters you need and which ones you don't <laughs> yeah. um, so okay so we have heat waves uh, in Asia, floods in Los Angeles. What other disasters? Do you, I mean, you wrote a book about kind of disasters in the world, how the world breaks. Um, what other disasters do you think he should have included, maybe? Um, you mean uh, disasters that haven't happened yet? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. disasters that you think he should have had in his book. Um. Miami. I think. <laughs> right. um, well, yeah, oh, yeah, we had a chapter. That was our one chapter in the disaster book. It was a, a, a future disaster, although we weren't um, describing it. We were just talking about what is not being done to prevent yeah. it and uh, using the 
a great Miami hurricane of 1927 to um, say what, what would happen if that uh, happened today. Um, I, um, well, it's um, not uh, one of those um, um, one time punchy disasters, but I, I think the um, uh, loss of the uh, um, uh, the rainforests of the Amazon and Congo uh, is going to be pretty catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, he does some stuff. We'll get to that. He does some stuff with forests that mm -hmm. uh, seems all right to me. But yeah. let's go through because you have we both have, but you have, I think, uh, even more informed critiques of a lot of geoengineering uh, solutions, right. so to speak. <laughs> And there's a bunch of them in here. And KS, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, which I think I can call, we can call KSR. People call him KSR. <laughs> so KSR uh, is pretty explicit towards the end of the book where he talks about how geoengineering is anything. You know, it's there's no, the, the label geoengineering he doesn't think is helpful because there are things that are good that you do and there are things that, you, that are bad that you do. So, the big thing, Can uh, Canada, <laughs> the big thing India <laughs> does uh, at the beginning of the book to address the heat wave is they spray aerosols into the sky to try to reduce the amount of energy coming from the sun. Uh, they keep comparing it to a volcanic event, Mount Pinatubo, which happened, I don't know, 80s, 90s, uh, and reduced yeah. global temperature for a few years. So what do you think about that one, Stan? What do we think about that one? Yeah. yeah, this one has been around for a while and um, hasn't uh, been done, uh, fortunately, I think, because there there has been by people who know more than I do a, a lot of um, uh, critique of it. Um, and just uh, briefly, the worst things, uh, one is that it, um, creates uh, what's called a moral hazard that it's it will it's known that if we start doing this then efforts to end fossil fuel burning uh, reduce emissions are going to slack off and, and we will not have the incentive we need to do it and and that's a problem because it, what it will mean is that this aerosol spring is going to have to continue uh, infinitely yeah. because the um, CO2 concentration of the atmosphere will continue to rise and uh, and it's predicted that if you go on for a decade or two doing this and haven't controlled emissions that you let it off and you get a very severe uh, rebound and yeah. and uh, extremely fast um, heating of the earth. Um, By I, the and, way, and, uh, <laughs> in Cory Doctorow's 2021 thread, he cites mm -hmm. someone named Oliver Morton, and mm -hmm. Oliver Morton calls this uh, a, a sustained contradiction, uh, re relieving the urgency of addressing carbon production and accumulating new policy debt. So that's, yes. uh, I think that's I exactly that. what you're yeah. talking about. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. And then, and then there are other things like the, um, uh, the colder, like Russia, they may not um, appreciate this at all. It could mean that, yeah, Russia becomes much of it, even more of it becomes too cold for agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. Yeah, you could get a famine out of this intervention easily. You could get all kinds of disastrous yeah. things that happen. <laughs> and and I think uh, uh, Robinson's other really, uh, the, the other thing that I, I'm convinced is not going to work, which uh, apparently in the book is quite successful, is this uh, climate coin or or carbon okay, coin. let's let's get to the carbo <laughs> coin because we have a lot to say about the carbon <laughs> coin, uh, you and me. Yeah. But let's do the, the let's do the geo let's do the strictly okay. geoengineering first. So there's the next one is pumping water. So there's a whole oil pumps or whatever drills. Yeah. And pumps are used to pump water to the surface of the glacier 
in Antarctica, maybe in the Arctic too, yeah. in order to, so once it's on the top, it freezes. So they kind of pump warm water to the top of the glacier so that it continuously freezes. And they use that to prevent the melting of the glacier, the rise of uh, right. ocean levels. How about that one? Yeah, yeah, I was very interested in that because I had never seen that proposed, uh, and I don't know if it is. I um, did do a quick scan of yeah. scientific literature. There is apparently yeah. people talking about it. I don't know. Yeah, how much more than that. There is. And 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 I didn't see where he um, calculated the uh emissions that came from the equipment the pumps uh, yeah <laughs> that, he, that's did, a, a he did figure that it work. yeah he did figure <laughs> that it was there was a problem there but it was uh the benefit <clears throat> outweighed the, the cost yeah yeah anyway kind of like the um the the um the other the aerosol spraying this seemed to me like a, a sisyphus uh effort mm -hmm. because until you got uh, Earth's temperature back down um, to, I guess, pre-industrial <laughs> levels. Mm -hmm. The um, that the melting, you know, what you're pumping up there that freezes on top. The the whole idea was that the glacier melts from the bottom, and so yeah. um, so that bottom water is going out, and so you uh, pump it back up and put it on top where it'll freeze again. But um, it, it's it, it it seems like one more thing that unless the the um, atmospheric geoengineering is extremely effective and you bring it down to pre-industrial level the temperature down to pre-industrial levels it seems like you're going to be pumping that uh, water forever. How about uh, carbon capture, storage, and and uh, converting all the oil? infrastructure that pumps oil out of the ground into pumping uh, carbon dry ice deep into the earth. That's Don't get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> You've actually written about that, I think. I think we've even talked about that one. Here. <clears throat> uh, You're not a Yes, person. this, um, there are two ways, uh, are two ways in which this is done. We can set aside the way that, say, the Biden administration is proposing to do it, et cetera, which is to capture um, carbon dioxide from the exhaust, from the, the smokestacks of, of coal and gas power plants, um, freeze it or, or liquefy it at very low temperature, pipe it for hundreds of miles and bury it in abandoned oil wells. Um, what they're doing, though, um, it, currently the only times they're doing this, they're pumping it into uh, abandoned oil wells that still have some hard to get oil in there. And so they're forcing that oil out with the carbon dioxide uh, out of the ground so they can refine it into gasoline and its carbon can go back <laughs> into the atmosphere. But um, um, what um they're talking or what he's talking about in this book i i believe is direct air capture which um takes they, they use um yeah. these techniques to extract carbon dioxide from the uh, atmosphere which um is extremely expensive or energy expensive uh, thing to do um and uh, but because carbon dioxide is a very tiny fraction of, of a percent of the atmosphere, um, and so it, you can't. It, 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 that's like uh, the proverbial needle in a haystack to find those to get those molecules out. Um, but We're anyway, talking about differences <laughs> in parts per million. That's the whole debate. Yeah. Is yeah. can we afford to go higher than what are we at? Four hundred parts per million, right? Yeah, uh, and, and as the um, uh, Patrick Moriarty, an Australian guy who's expert on this, um, he said, "What what you end up with is you would have to have uh, um, this plant for extracting CO two from the atmosphere. You would have 
have to have next to it a, a gas fired power plant that would mm -hmm. um, uh, be powering the CO2 plant, but the, the power plant would be producing just about the same quantity of emissions as the <laughs> CO2 plant was capturing. So then you need one of these um, plants next to it that is capturing the uh, fumes from the smokestack of the power plant, and and you would need to and keep going uh, forever. Operate, yeah, and power it with uh, wind and solar instead of just you know, just yeah. generate the electricity with wind and solar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, okay, what about sails? Uh, going back to sailing, because uh, terrorists, who we'll talk about more use uh, drone attacks to blow up a lot of shipping lanes and ship uh, tankers yeah. and uh, yeah. is that what they're called? Tankers? Yeah, giant yeah. tanker ships. Yeah. Car container ships, that's what they're called. So they blow a lot of the container ships up so they have to go back to sailing. But they have like sophisticated sails that like have solar on them. And so, yeah. So they produce electricity. Yeah. Like that one. Do we like that one? This one we like. It's um, fresh. <laughs> now it. It's not um, rotten. It's fresh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I believe there is an effort now. I think maybe some European firms are trying to uh, start to start up this, but it's it's kind of like um, um, solar power and wind power trying to replace fossil fuels. It, sailing ships will never be able to carry the huge volume of of goods and products that um that shipping today with diesel fueled can but they kind of like ship things because they have the space now yeah right, right. it's like yeah, oh yeah. we have all the space what are we going to yeah. fill it with <laughs> so. yeah we would just yeah we would need a lot less um uh, global trade basically yeah uh, okay, then these are some ones I think are pretty fresh-ish. Um, lots of stuff about habitat conservation, regenerative yeah. agriculture, or uh, soil yeah. permaculture. We like all this stuff, right? Yes, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Okay, he does a lot, of, and he does a lot of that. So I don't want to I don't want to leave people with the impression that he's not into that stuff. He is, you know. Yeah, uh, it's we're we're kind of picking on the things that we don't like, but there's again a lot that I like uh, in this book. So I want to talk about about the characters. It's interesting because this is not a book that's like driven by the characters and their arcs and their conflicts. There's a guy named Frank who's in the heat wave, so you can experience the heat wave. He gets PTSD. He becomes a terrorist. He kills somebody on a beach. He goes and yells at Mary. I'll tell you about Mary in a second. Uh, <laughs> then he works with some refugees and he goes to jail and he dies of cancer. I mean, it's just tragic, <laughs> tragic arc for Frank. Uh, there's Mary. Mary's the head of the ministry for the future. She takes us through everything because she's in all the meetings and everywhere you need to be, Mary is, right? So you get that. She has a she has a Nepali right-hand man, Badim, and Badim was in the war. Badim was the head of the Dirty Tricks division for the Ministry for the Future, because there's <laughs> all but maybe there's some link to the terrorist organizations, which we'll get to. Um, and then there's Tatiana. Kind of upsets me, Tatiana, because Tatiana's just a lawyer from Russia, and basically because she's Russian, she gets killed near the end. It's just like, ah, she's Russian. You know, these Russians, they kill each other. They blow each other up and poison each other and everything. It's bad. Um, so... But the point, my point here is, I actually don't mind this. Like, there are characters that are not that important. The character and their story is not that important. It's like, there's a lot, he's doing a lot more in the book than just giving you the hero's journey of Mary and her personal psychological transformation, right? It's, yeah, it's, yeah. And I think I, we need more books like this. I don't think we need every, every book in the world to be about, like, yeah. personal fulfillment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great thing about this book. <laughs> Thank God, not another hero's journey. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so um, although he does kind of throw this random romantic thing at the end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> at the very end, he yeah, just throws that Mary, he gives Mary a boyfriend and they go, go around the world together. 
Um, okay, so now we get into my uh, the geopolitics, which is where I start getting really, um, you know, where I, I find the weaknesses start piling up because geopolitics, international politics is a huge part of this book. And it has to be if you're talking about the future of climate and the earth, you have to uh, talk about geopolitics. You have to talk about international relations and the global economy and all of these things. And um, I think this is where some of the weakest parts of the book are. So he has a terrorist. So after the heat wave, there's a terrorist organization called the Children of Cali. So they're <laughs> terrorists from India and they're Indian terrorists and they're covert. India has also long since just seen the BJP off. They, the heat wave was the end of the BJP. <laughs> it was the end of Congress. It's a new democratic, decentral kind of socialistic uh, India and India leads the way on pretty much everything. India is KSR's like key, you know, India is the key to everything for KSR. And Kerala in India <laughs> is the key to the key. Which, you know, it's it's very flattering to me because that's where I'm from. But uh, I don't think we I don't I don't think we deserve this burden <laughs> that KSR puts on us. I don't think we can live up to it. All up to you. Um, with, <laughs> so, uh, so the children of Cali, they kill executives, they kill fossil fuel executives, they aim right at the top, so they kill just the most important decision makers. They kill all of them. It's like, you know, nobody wants to be the CEO of an oil company because the children of Cali are going to kill you. Like, they, they kill them. They're like ninjas. They sneak into places and kill them. They kill them in their cars. They kill them in their homes. They kill them everywhere. Um, then, to stop commercial flight... They use drones and they kill 7,000 people, civilians, in a single day with drone attacks on commercial flights. So that basically wipes out commercial flight. People don't want to do it anymore. There's lots of, there's just, it just radically reduces emissions from commercial flight um, through terrorism. Meat. So cattle, methane and, and meat, uh, they, they, uh, they use uh uh, mad cow disease to infect cows and the mad cow disease basically means that you know radically you reduce the sizes of herds and cows uh cow production and and uh, milk production and meat production now we have a friend <laughs> should we talk about our friend <laughs> who yeah. was bitten by because there's a low there's a tick called the lone star tick which if it bites you you actually can't eat anything with hooves anymore you can only eat birds if you want to eat animals right and fish <laughs> and fish yeah you can't eat any cows you can't eat any goats you can't eat any sheep you can't eat any pigs you can't eat anything that this tick lives on it just what does it do to what does it do to you if you eat it um well the tick releases this small i guess it's a uh a peptide of some kind of a polypeptide uh, called alpha gal and mm -hmm. this um, um causes you to have a uh, a very severe allergic reaction to eating meat in fact you know you can go into anaphylactic shock uh, quite um, easily and as you said our friend uh, has had a couple of instances when in one case where he went to a Burger King and ordered an impossible Whopper and these guys in, in Iowa, and he thinks these guys thought they were playing a trick on him. And he he had he got back in the car and was driving on to Minnesota and had very severe a reaction before he realized it. That's how good the impossible burger is. Yeah. You don't even notice you're, you notice. you're not eating that you're eating meat, but he made it to a hospital. Gosh, yeah, that I mean, if I was advising the children of Cali terrorists, I would say use the Lone Star Tick rather than mad cow disease. Mad cow disease is such a slow, you know, yeah. anyway, um, there's they also attack retail stores. They take uh, I, I assume they're telling he's talking about Walmart, but he talks about retail stores and, and that yeah. uh, infrastructure through terrorism. And they blow up uh, the, the pipe. They blow up the pipeline between um, Russia and Germany. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I'm like, you didn't need the children of Cali to do that. All you need is America to do that. 
Um, I don't yeah. know. I'm just referring to the Seymour Hirsch story. How how what is it? How America blew up Nord Stream? Anyway, check that out. It's on Substack. Probably gazillion people have read it. <laughs> I certainly yeah. read it. So I wonder if uh, Seymour read the Ministry for the Future before. <laughs> 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 I wonder if the people at that dive school, there's a dive school. I think it's actually in Iowa. It opens. I don't know. Did you read? Have you read that? Uh, um, no. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, let me let me let me tell you because um, Seymour Hirsch, because he starts off at this uh, how America took out the Nord Stream pipeline. And he starts off at the dive school. The U.S. Navy's diving and salvage center can be found in a location as it's as obscure as its name, it's not Iowa, it's Florida, down what was once a country lane in rural Panama City and now booming resort city in the southwestern panhandle of Florida, 70 <laughs> miles south of the Alabama border. So he talks about how they have the facilities to train, to do this kind of diving, to do all of these kinds of operations, the type of explosive that they used. I don't think the children of Cali were up for this job. To do that, they, they had to, yeah. had to use a, a, a type of explosive that was triggered by sound, right? And the issue was uh, whether they could have it not blow up until they until they triggered it. So there's like a whole, there's a whole background of sound in the ocean. And so yeah. it could, it could be, it could be trig triggered. So the longer they, they put the explosive down, apparently, if this is true, <laughs> if Seymour Hirsch is right, they put the explosive down in like June and they didn't blow it up until September. But they were worried each week they were like, it could blow up on its own. And the longer they waited, the more the chances that something else, some other sound profile would make it go off. Oh, anyway. uh, children of Cali, have got nothing on <laughs> the U.S. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, that's the children of Cali. So terrorism is a big part of this uh, this story. Um, the Ministry for the Future itself, there they've got Tatiana suing polluters. Uh, she, Mary is going around negotiating agreements. Um, they have a whole kind of religious thing that they do. And then the other two things they do, the two major moves that they make is one, they have a kind of like a computer hacking AI division where they use that to create an open source social network that is so much more compelling and better than <laughs> Facebook and Twitter and all of this other crap. And so it just puts them all out of business because people just are able to control their own data and control their own social networks. <laughs> it's a, a gigantic hand wave, as we yes. say, say. Uh, because if you could have done that, you know, yeah. that well, there's no reason that wouldn't have happened in the first place. And then um, the other thing that he does is the carbon coin. Shall we talk carbon coin? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, you, um, you first. No, no. Yeah, uh, maybe if if you um, uh, explain, is it how okay. it differs so here's from how, uh, carbon tax or uh, okay so carbon tax is part of it right carbon tax is basically governments charging uh gas companies whatever anything anyone who uses carbon they get charged a tax so it's a disincentive anyone everyone tries to avoid paying taxes so if you have to pay a tax for every ton of carbon you use or whatever then uh, you can you'll you'll have a, a disincentive to try to use it. Of course, um, in Canada we have a carbon tax. I don't think it's been all that successful, but it's also been a source of a lot of resentment and a lot of fascists uh, make a big deal out of this. They they say you know thank Trudeau for your high gas bills, whatever. Uh, and then there's also um they just pass it on right the gas companies can just pass it on to the consumer so it's not exactly disincentivizing anything maybe if it was even 10 times higher or something i'm not sure exactly what you would need to do to a carbon tax to yeah. make it work yeah yeah that's exactly it that we're at the point that um fossil fuels need to be phased out so quickly that the carbon price would have to be yeah. Um, they're huge, and it would have to keep getting uh, uh, higher and higher. Um, yeah. um, 
and and right now the European carbon price or um, or uh, the one or California and all their they're com comically low. I, I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah there. <laughs> so the other thing that they recommend is something called or that they recommend. The other thing that KSR does is this carbon coin. So the carbon coin, or other, he also calls it carbon quantitative easing. So the idea is, um, and you know, it comes from MMT, modern yeah. monetary theory. The point is that the currency issuer can create money at any time. And the way that we create money now, the way that governments create money now is they basically allow banks to create money when they make loans. And so every dollar that's created also creates debt, which is there's another school of thought that doesn't like that and wants uh, governments to create debt free money. But that's a whole that's not quite the MMT people. The MMT people are like more their position is more that you shouldn't care too much about the fact that the government owes money. That doesn't matter because the government makes creates money. So debt is the government debt is not something to stress out over. Uh, private debt is another issue. But so carbon quantitative easing means they are creating this carbon coin and they spend it into the economy so that it can then be used uh, as currency. And they spend it into the economy by giving it to basically countries who don't develop oil resources. So Saudi uh, has a military dictatorship, they opt for decarbonizing and they immediately get paid this immense bounty of carbon coins for not using all the oil that they have in the ground. So everybody gets paid, Lula gets paid, the indigenous in the Amazon get paid, everybody gets paid these carbon coins for not doing carbon operations. And then you can also get carbon coins for doing some of the geoengineering things we talked about, like pumping carbon into the ground. If you're decarbonizing, you can, um, you're doing regenerative agriculture, you're doing anything that's putting carbon, more carbon in the soil, that's putting more carbon in the trees, Anything that, like that that you're doing will get you carbon coins. So if you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere in any which way or keeping carbon out of the atmosphere, you get these carbon coins, which creates this source of financing for everything that you want to do with carbon. So I have some counter, I have some problems with this. I, I Not the problems you would think, uh, I yeah. think. Because I, you know, in a like I agree with modern monetary theory about what currency issuers can do. Uh, I don't disagree with uh, the idea, but <laughs> anyway, I'll get to my problems uh, when I get to. We have a whole section of critique, like uh, fairly extensive. But do you have other? Do you have other uh, critiques? Um, of. Um... Uh, of, of carbon, carbon coin, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I also have not figured out a, a, a reason to oppose modern monetary theory because <laughs> I. But it's fishy, though, right? Really There's still yeah, yeah, about yeah, it. yeah. It, <laughs> it does seem fishy, but <clears throat> um, one the, one of the things that is is uh, the main thing that has driven the rise in general ecological destruction has been um, economic growth and unless I, I don't see how this huge amount of money you know even if it's being dumped in Saudi Arabia and in uh, Brazil if it, it gets into the world economy it's it's going to end up being spent by people in Texas and uh, Iowa and um, it's and there's no um, no nothing to stop people spending it on uh, ecologically destructive stuff or companies spending it on um, uh, production that you know wasteful and um, unless you're harmful afraid of production. a visit from the children of Cali <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, that I guess if it's tag teaming with the Kali, uh, but um, as you know, I, it's my firm belief that without uh, an enforced um, statutory 
uh, drive down in the quantities of uh, fossil fuels extracted each year in, in the major um, uh, countries that it's, um, no, it's not going to, uh, yeah, we're not going to happen. So you need, yeah, you need a little bit more of a stick <laughs> and a little bit yeah. less of a carrot, right? Right. So, and, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And so I think, uh, you know, uh, talking to you about your comments about this, it, um, the state, you have to have the right kind of action by powerful states to yeah. uh, do this and Speaking not, not of powerful like, states. <laughs> yes. uh, KSR is not a fan of China. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this man is not a fan of China. My God, uh, China, he calls it. I mean, he's not calling it. He's putting the words in the mouth of one or the other characters, but it's pretty clear <laughs> that yeah. this is not a view that KSR opposes. China is debt laden, opaque, oligarchic and authoritarian. Um, China experiences some kind of like Tiananmen Square 2.0. They force them to do all kinds of democratic transformations. And I mean, co constant contrast of China with India. So India is basically good because it's democratic and China is basically bad because it's authoritarian. And I'm just like watching India. You know, you we, we did a we did an episode. Our last episode, I think, is about India. And yeah. India is uh, demo, democratic is not the word I would use to describe mm -hmm. unless you know unless you take democracy unless you think democracy sucks which I'm I'm willing to entertain mm -hmm. that like if you think democracy means mafias uh, electoral processes that involve huge amounts of organized violence uh, police worship it, it, you know private property buying elections. If you think that that's democracy, then yeah, sure, India is a democracy, and it's used that democratic process to become fascist. Um, yeah, yeah, and more. it is a it's it's a pretty mature, you know, in ten ten years in, it's I'd say a pretty mature fascist state now. Yeah, um, the experts it, are, are saying it's farthest along the road to fascism yeah. than any other country. Yeah, I don't think it's going anywhere. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Maybe the heat wave, maybe he's right and a heat wave will drive them out. I think a heat, I think, I think they'll just blame a heat wave on the Muslims too. You know, they'll just yeah, be like, it was right. the Muslims. And then they'll have more Muslim riots. Um, so China, not a fan of China, not a fan of Russia. Uh, lots of poisoning and assassinations and missiles and stuff like that. That's what that's what we get out of uh, out of Russia. The U.S. You know, it's kind of invisible. There's some criticism of the U.S. at the end that the U.S. behaves like an empire. Um, <laughs> you know, but there's a uh, Mary at one point. She says, you know, it's easy to blame the U.S. for everything, but I'm never comfortable with that. There's so much good along with the bad. Uh, She's country, Irish, country. by the way. She's Irish. And so the American guy she's telling this to, Frank, Frank says, I mean, you you can't, uh, I bet you don't say that about the British or something. And she says, she says, it has to be said there was some good in the Brits and their empire, even in Ireland. Oh, my God, Mary. Mary, you're killing me. Oh, Mary. Yeah. So that was, that was rough. That was rough. It was one of the hardest. It was towards the end, thankfully. So we were near the end. Mm -hmm. um, Europe is weird. Europe, they have these kind of, they have some kind of terrorism in Europe too. They have these uh, nonviolent people kind of kidnap the Davos. They kidnap the World <laughs> Economic Forum, make them watch a bunch of videos. I don't know what, the, I don't know what that was. Yeah. Uh, there's an Occupy movement in Paris. Nothing much happens there. I don't know. I don't know the deal. Um, Africa, also not a lot going on. At one point, Africa says we're not paying our debts, which I think is great. They've got to do that. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm here for yeah. that. I'll do it all day. There's, but there's like a weird thing where like somebody unexplained comes and liberates a mine and kind of hands it over to the African miners and tells them you own the mine now. And it's sort of like, who, who, who is this? <laughs> who is this mysterious benefactor? Yeah. Right. Uh, um, one... <laughs> and, uh, and then we have like population. They they, they kind of talk about indices a lot. Uh, you and I are into indices these days, yeah, so they talk yeah. about indices and how towards the end the population is is slowing down and inequality is decreasing. 
Um, so all kinds of tracking. So that's how they show that the world has changed and it's it's kind of on its way to becoming a better place. So shall we <laughs> shall we get into the old uh, they're not going to let you do it? So yeah. so here's a bunch of things I noticed that are on my mind that hit, that don't get onto KSR's radar. And again, it would be one thing if if world politics was not a big deal, but it is a big deal in his book. So that man he got, does kind of purport to cover the whole world. So we have to ask like what's going on? Where's the rest of the stuff, right? So yeah. Palestine didn't didn't manage to free itself. There's no no uh, no one state solution, no end of apartheid, nothing like that going on for the Palestinians. Kurdistan does, but Palestine doesn't. So and there's no like pan Arab state or anything like that. Uh, nothing. There's no pan African, no pan Arab, no pan nothing. <laughs> no no pan American, no no nothing. No not that that kind of integration. He doesn't like that, right? He's he's kind of anarchist inclined so it's all local maximum local power devolved to local people and and localized which is a, which kind of takes us back to your essay right because like <laughs> you're talking yeah. about how sometimes local is good and sometimes local is bad and needs to be yeah. overruled because it's like local yeah. discrimination and local oppression yeah uh there's no sanctions regime so like the us and the united nations are kind of sanctioning like one third of the world or something right now you know cuba venezuela iran there's all these all the like the world economy kind of runs on sanctions now and that's not really in there that was there in 2020 that's not a that's not a thing that arose after yeah. ksr published the book right yeah <laughs> um the there's the, like the the there's like this U.S. is an empire, but there's no specific addressing of Iraq or Syria or Libya or Yemen or Afghanistan or Haiti. Um, there's no decolonizing Guantanamo. There's no decolonizing Puerto Rico. There's no decolonizing Hawaii. So those are all kind of upsetting to me. There's no special thing happening with Black America, which I think and right. the road to any liberation any liberatory process is probably going to have to involve some yeah. specific um things going on in black america and new africa and also first nations there's some kind of assumption that first nations are doing stuff uh mentioned here and there but like the whole kind of systematic land back movement that i think again is going to have to be a huge part of the solution in the Amer in north america is not really didn't really yeah, make it. I was really surprised at that. I, I would have yeah. expected him to really uh, hit that hard. Yeah, there should have been a native character, like one of these people should have been uh, a, an indigenous person, and, and like just that whole thing should have been advancing. Um, so basically, I would say as between this and the treatment of India and China. And like, there's no North Korea, obviously. I've already mentioned Cuba. So it's like, um, this is like what what communists call like the actually existing socialist countries, right? The the kind and and what what I think if you're Trotskyist or you're an anarchist, you basically argue that those aren't real socialism, right? And I get that kind of vibe from KSR that it's like liberal institutions, elections, decentralized power is good. And like organized parties, armed struggle, central states and central plans are bad. Um, and so what what that kind of leaves is the terrorism thing. And a lot of the terrorism that they're doing, you can't do if you're illegal, some illegal group in India. They They're can't. There's no way some little group in India could crash all the planes. And I don't even think you should crash all the planes in, you know, commercial yeah. flights. I would <laughs> rather, I would rather you had a central state that, you know, passed a law, <laughs> and then, and then, and then, uh, and then right. you know, just go to you go to the airport and you're like, your flight's not flying today. Didn't <laughs> this that one didn't have to be terrorism? I don't think. <laughs> Whatever, you know, it was, it was bad. But you can't kidnap the World Economic Forum attendees 
You can't even have like a sustained assassination campaign unless you're a state. And even like, even if the U, like, even if the U.S. was like, we're gonna ass- we're gonna start assassinating Chinese uh, leaders. That the U.S. is the strongest state in the world, but that would not that would not be a good idea for the U.S. to do that. No. You know, like that's, <laughs> I wouldn't even uh, you know even when they assassinate Iranian scientists, they're <laughs> like, oh God, what you know? They killed Soleimani, <laughs> and then they were like, okay, uh, are we? And then Iran launched a bunch of missiles at an American base. So you you can't. I don't think this would work. So. You can't spontaneously organize terrorism on the scale that he's talking about. When you're talking about that scale, you're not talking about covert, sneaky terrorism. You're talking about overt, organized, armed yeah. struggle by states. Um, and then the other thing is uh, the whole carbon coin. And the carbon coin, this is something I only have started to understand recently and I've been writing about it a lot and thinking about it a lot. But like when you have a global currency regime, so we had the gold standard and bimetallic under the British Empire, we had dollarization and now maybe we're living through a de-dollarization, right? But but all, up until for the past 200 plus years, at least maybe five, four or 500, if you count Spanish Empire, Portuguese, the currency regimes of the world that are run by empires are based on getting something for nothing. So when it was the British Empire and they had the gold and the silver, they would charge India taxes and they would they assigned a huge debt to India and they said India has to pay its debt. Every farmer has to pay their taxes. People have to pay their taxes in silver. And they got all of India's agricultural commodities basically for free. They got them to pay them in taxes. Then they pumped all this money into the global economy that way. And so they were continuously squeezing India and their other colonies to get something for nothing to keep their currency, to keep the currency system going. And if you look at like the dollar, and you look at Jason Hickel, who's the most environmentally inclined. There are others like the Putnayaks and Zach Cope. I always mention these, but but hey, J- Jason Hickel's work talks about the drain, the continuous drain of wealth from the global south to the global north. That wealth that he estimated a few years ago to be like $2 trillion a year. Through debt, through intellectual property, patents, uh, brain drain, uh, unequal, like transfer pricing, internal corporate pricing, all kinds of mechanisms. There are many mechanisms, maybe about 15 or 20 different mechanisms, but all of them add up to sucking $2 trillion of wealth from the third world to the first world, from the global south to the global north. And that's what upholds the currency system. That's what upholds the global currency yeah. system. So, and if you, ju- you can't just create a carbon coin because where are you going to get that something for nothing? Where are you going to get those commodities? And how are you going to command right. that labor? Um, and if you're not going to command that labor, then that's you're talking about huge changes in living standards globally in all situations. In fact, it could be more cataclysmic for the global north, including Zurich, where Mary Robinson is hanging okay. out. Mary Robinson, not Mary Robinson, Mary Murphy. <laughs> I, 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 I think I, right. I know who he meant to, I know who he meant by Mary, but where Mary <laughs> Murphy is hanging out, um, that would be in some ways more cataclysmic than some of the climate things that he's talking about, like the, the drop in living standards that would come from not being able to pillage the third world at will. So because there's this flaw in the analysis of the global economy, the whole global economic solution that he proposes in the form of the carbon coin and carbon taxes is equally kind of flawed. And so that means that when we try to map this onto a strategy for what we can do about the climate in in real life, we have to address the missing analysis of the ongoing 
two trillion dollar transfer every year or maybe it's three by now whatever so that is basically my criticism of the carbon coin uh, yeah in in addition to uh, you know i think your point is also a really good one that it also will just heat up the economy and move you know cause yeah. a lot of throughput which is exactly what we're trying to yeah. damp down on yeah i think and, and he should have i'm not one to give him advice but i wish he had um instead looked at something like what the um, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is uh, proposing that um, the, the rich high emitting countries, um, they um, pledge to reduce their extraction and import of uh, fossil fuels um, at, a, at a certain rate. Um, and then at, at the same time, they um, they pledge certain amounts of money, a, a lot more than what was pledged under the Paris Agreement and so forth, to as kind of green funds going to um, uh, the global south uh, for um, replacing uh, fossil energy with um, with renewable energy and uh, increasing in in some cases the amount of energy people have available in 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 those countries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's one of the things about your book, um, Beyond the Green New Deal. Yeah, that I really liked, which is that um, you actually acknowledge that in some countries the energy yeah. consumption actually needs to go up. He does yeah. too. He does too. Uh, yeah. KSR does too. But so how do we summarize? You know, my problem is that I think that this is a little bit, I don't think he means it this way, but by so, a lot of the geopolitical choices that he makes kind of add up to softish imperialism <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I don't mean to yeah. use the I word, but like, it's kind of like a loyal opposition to imperialism that I that I get from it, um, and I think, you know, to uh, to paraphrase what I think Stan Cox's problem would be with it is like, it's just a kind of a techno optimism. It's a it's a it's a little bit on the eco modernist yeah tip a little bit like he, you know, he wants to do both right. He wants to yeah. have. He wants to have carbon coins and and um, all those kinds of innovations, aerosols and and pumping the glaciers. But he also wants agricultural, you know, transformation and restoration. yeah, yeah, and um, wants to do it all without um, strong state action. Yeah, yeah, there. exactly. It can all be done through local decentralized yeah. acts, including like including just like horrific terrorist acts. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That, are, that are like not necessary if you have if you have a powerful state. You don't even need to do that. You can just say like, isn't that what's great about China? Yeah. Like what's great about China is yeah. if they're convinced of something, they can just do it. Yeah. Like, like they can just they could just they could just do it and you know we're gonna plant a trillion trees okay well here we go you know yeah we're gonna do solar we're gonna just do solar <laughs> for half of everything okay now they they are talking a much better game than they're actually yeah yeah lot, but no yeah. but i mean you know they have but they can capacity do yeah exactly yeah. so it's like if they're if they're not fulfilling what they're talking about it's like that means probably they're not convinced, yeah. <laughs> but but it's like if they're convinced, they can do it. And it's like you can't do that with the children of Cali or even Kerala, like just decentralized panchayat governance. Yeah. So, yeah. So I don't know. One one thumb up for sure. Maybe one and a yeah. half thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. I would say one and a half. Um, some some <laughs> geopolitical quibbles, but uh, but yeah, really important uh, book, definitely worth talking about. So, which is why we did. Uh, okay, where are we going next? What do you do? What's your next dispatch on? 
Well, I was wondering maybe uh, we could uh, join forces and kind of write write up our uh, critique for in real time. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're on. I'm. Uh, I uh, happen to be a co-contributor with KSR to a book that's coming out in September where he oh. he um, it's called Democracy in a Hotter Time. He wrote uh, has written uh, the afterword for it. Bill McKibben has written the foreword or, not, or the uh, introduction, I guess, mm -hmm. and um, they're. I don't know, maybe 15 um, chapters written, all, all written by uh, different people. Uh, David Orr is the uh, editor, MIT Press. So uh, be looking for it in September. Okay. <laughs> his, his, uh, afterward, I, li I like, as you know, it's obviously nonfiction, but uh, I like most of it, but it, um, it, Still, no strong state action there. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not easy to get used to, I guess. Uh, it was it was painful for me. There's a there's actually a book about this called Socialist States and the Environment by uh, oh. Salvatore Engel de Moro. Did you did you? Ever oh, that one? No. yeah, Salvatore Engel de Moro. He's an academic somewhere in the states, I think. And he wrote this book, and it's the the opening of the book. He's like, "Look, I I I'm an anarchist. Like, I was an anarchist, and I you know just got into reading about like the Soviet um, and the Chinese and the Cuban projects, like agroecology and the the forest conservation under the Soviet Union under Stalin, yeah. <laughs> and, and like and he's like, these were all good things. <laughs> yeah. and he's like." Uh, it, it made my brain explode because I'm an anarchist and how could these states be doing these things that, you know, you can't do in like decentralized collective uh, thing. So he, he had this whole thing and uh, and it was around the environment that he came to this conclusion that yeah. you know, some of these things are, are you need a state for. And uh, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> it's painful. Yeah. But here we are. All right, let's All right. stop.